You're listening to The Continuing Adventures of Billy Barbarian, written and read by J.R. Murdoch. For more information, please visit ofgnomesanddwarves.com or jrmurdoch.com. Billy and Jack weren't questioned, despite Billy carrying an unconscious man, when they re-entered the stadium. Billy looked at his badge as if it held some mystical power. He wondered if he'd allow him into other places as well. Now remember, Billy, just tie him up and let's get back on stage. I'm sure Fat is mad, and if we're lucky, he hasn't told him on yet. The last thing we need to do is get into trouble. Right. Billy dumped the would-be assassin in the hallway opposite Celine's dressing room. He removed his pack and took out a length of rope and bound the man's hand and feet. Jack checked the knots when Billy finished, and they headed back up the stairs. As they mounted the stairs, Jack jumped and pawed at his pocket. I guess someone wants to talk to us. He pulled the orb from his pocket. This is Jack. Jack, this Fat, where are you? Fat didn't sound angry or rushed as he had before. We're on the way back to the stage. Good. Stop by and have drink with Phil and me. Jack looked up nervously at Billy. I don't think this is good. The last time Fat got drunk... The statement went unfinished as Jack pocketed the orb and then sprinted up the stairs. His strength obviously returned. Billy righted his pack on his back and followed. He wondered what Fat, such a small man, could have done while drunk. Better yet, why was Fat drinking while they were supposed to be working? It didn't matter so much to Billy. The opportunity to drink with Phil sounded like fun. At the top of the stairs, the music returned full force. Celine's voice loud and clear over the orchestra. Billy paused for a moment to listen. He wished he could be in the audience watching, instead of being backstage and just listening. Her voice felt as if it spoke directly to his heart. Billy, come on, they're waiting. Fat sat at the same table they sat at before with Phil. Fat looked happy. Phil, on the other hand, wore a deep frown. One of his jagged teeth stuck in his cheek and blood trickled from the wound. He motioned for them to sit down. Drinks waited for them. I tell you, Jack, Phil, good fun to be with. Fat put his arm around Jack and laughed. Phil crossed his arms over his chest as the two sat down. And where did the two of you get off to? I'd think that working as security for Celine, you'd be a little more concerned and stay near her. But you don't understand. We had to catch someone. Billy took a quick swig of his drink. Phil wrinkled his face. A shimmer ran through his scales. What do you mean you had to catch someone? Someone tried to kill her. We had to chase that person. We chased him into town. Did you catch him? Phil's tone changed from scolding parent to interested friend. Oh, yes. It wasn't easy. We chased him, and he ran into one of your stores. Phil looked skyward for a moment. The one over on Byer Street? Jack nodded. That's the one. Fat pulled Jack in closer. I like you, Jack. You're so good to go catch bad men. How much easy he had to drink? asked Jack. Phil nodded his head to Fat's glass. That's it. Billy finished his glass of whatever they were drinking. It had a fruity taste. He noticed that Fat had only finished about half of his. You mean he's only had half that drink? Jack started and then pushed Fat away. And he's drunk already? Yep. I found it strange. He'll be passed out if he finishes it. We should find somewhere to stash him. Jack, I love you. And fast. Billy scratched his head. I don't understand. What happened? Phil frowned. He's drunk. He must not drink very often. I've had several of these during the show. I didn't think they'd hit him that quickly. So what do we do with him? Billy asked. I guess we can take him downstairs. There are couches in some of the dressing rooms. Billy perked up. Great. We can show you that person we caught as well. I think we should head down there then. They all stood up. Jack held Fat to his feet, and they struggled along. Fat's feet kept slipping out from under him. He really couldn't handle his drink. In the north, Fat would have had a really difficult time, being that much of a barbarian's time was spent drinking and talking. Even as a youth, Billy could drink more than Fat. The four went downstairs, Phil in the lead. Celine's crooning faded as they went down. Billy helped Jack, as Fat had all but passed out on the way down the stairs. You said something about the last time Fat got drunk. Billy said to Jack. Well, it's a long story. I'll tell you later, but yeah, the last time we worked with Iman, Fat got drunk. It wasn't good. How so? I'll tell you later. 
Let's show Phil the guy you caught. Phil stood over the man in black and shook his head. He looked up at the other three as they arrived. What is it? Billy asked. Let's take care of Fat first. This is bigger than I thought. Bigger? Come on, there's a couch in Celine's dressing room. Phil opened the door and Billy carried the now unconscious Fat into the room. Three assistants jumped when the four came into the room and looked nervous. Billy smiled at them and they instantly started whispering to each other. Just put him on the couch. You three, keep an eye on him. If he wakes up, give him some water, and one of you come and get me. Understood? The three nodded their heads vigorously. Billy thought they looked as if they had been caught doing something wrong, but wanted to know what Phil knew about the man in black. He dumped Fat onto the couch, and Jack covered him. Phil waited by the door. Once Billy and Jack were back in the hall, Phil closed the door. Do either of you recognize him? Billy looked harder at the man. The dark complexion, the pointy mustache, there was something familiar about him. His eyes widened in realization. It's the pilot! Exactly. Like I said, this problem is bigger than I thought. I thought perhaps someone had an issue with Celine. I hired this guy. For him to try and kill her, something is up. Something big. I think you two need to get back on stage and keep your eyes peeled for anything, and I mean anything, out of the ordinary. Like what? Celine is due for an intermission. I want the two of you on either side of her when she gets off the stage. She'll complain, but ignore her. Her bark is far worse than her bite, and if she bites, bite back. Billy and Jack exchanged glances. Billy felt a sinking sensation in the pit of his stomach. Coming to the big city meant big things would happen, but this far exceeded anything he'd anticipated. Regardless, he had a job to do. He would do it the best he could. He and Jack got up and went back to the stage. Billy had taken up stage right, and Jack in the box took up stage left. It was torturous not to watch Celine sing and dance. Phil had said there'd be a break, an intermission he'd called it, and Billy could feel his hands sweat in anticipation. He bounced up and down on the balls of his feet, eager for her to stop singing. His eyes darted from person to person in the crowd. Everyone looked like a potential assassin to Billy. He closed his eyes, briefly, and took a deep breath. Relax, Billy. Relax. The orb in his pocket vibrated. He pulled it out. Yes? Billy, it's Jack. Get ready. I think this is the last song of the set. As soon as the curtain goes down, get on the side of her and let's get her off the stage. Right. Got it. Billy pocketed the orb and readied himself to race up to Celine's side. Nothing would keep him from getting to her. Nothing. Celine stopped singing and raised her hands into the air. The music rode to a crescendo and echoed throughout the stadium for several seconds after it stopped. The crowd thundered its applause and the curtain fell. Wasting no time, Billy pushed past one of the dancers to get to Celine's side. She had already turned and headed toward Jack's side of the stage. The rest of the dancers pranced off stage. What the hell is this? Celine demanded as Billy took her arm and Jack took her other arm. Strict orders, Jack replied. From who? Phil. He knows I don't like anyone touching me. Let me go. Let go of my arm, you big brute. Billy shook his head. No, I can't. Jack leaned in close to Celine. Phil wants to make sure you get downstairs, if you take my meaning. No, I don't. Celine pulled herself to a stop, effectively breaking free from Billy and Jack. Phil will explain everything once we're downstairs. We don't have time for this drama. Drama? Is that what you think I'm doing? Causing drama for drama's sake? I'll have you know. Billy picked her up and slung her over his shoulder and walked off the stage. He didn't want to waste any time on the stage arguing when they could just as easily do it in Celine's dressing room. She kicked, she spat, and she pounded on Billy with her tiny fists, and he ignored her as best he could, even when she bit into his shoulder. He did his best not to say anything, but when she pulled his hair and screamed in his ear, he stopped and feigned dropping her to the floor. I'm pretty tall, and if you keep that up, I will drop you. Don't you know who I am? I do. You're Celine Dijon. Your mother and my mother grew up together. You come from the same place I do. But you're acting like a spoiled child. That's all I need to know. That's right. I'm Celine Dijon, and I'll not be manhandled by Big Brute even if... Her voice trailed off, and her tone shifted from outrage to interest. Did you say you're from the same place I am? And our mothers grew up together? Yes, I'll explain all that later. Now, will you come quietly downstairs, or must I carry you like a sack of potatoes? Put me down, she said quietly. Billy put her down took her arm, 
and led her downstairs. She didn't say anything else. Billy felt bad for putting her in her place like he did, but he couldn't risk her being on the stage any longer than she needed. Something about the stage didn't feel right, almost like a power that didn't want anyone on stage. He blamed the assassin he'd caught. That must be playing with his mind. Celine pulled free when they got to the bottom of the stairs, and she saw Phil. Phil, what's going on? Why did they have to escort me off the stage? Phil pointed to the pilot. Celine gasped and put her hand over her mouth. Why is Ato tied up on the floor, and why is he dressed like that? Phil motioned for Billy and Jack to approach. I think you'll want to hear it from Billy. She turned and looked up at Billy. Her eyes were on the verge of welling up with tears. Billy? He explained what happened on the stage when the flaming arrow nearly struck her down. I thought that was just part of the show. Steve sometimes likes to put in something a little different into the show. I didn't think it could be someone trying to kill me. Why would someone try to kill me? Why would Ato try to kill me? We chased him through town. He really wanted to get away. We caught him hiding inside of one of Phil's stores. Jack patted Billy on the back. He keeps saying we, but I had a hard enough time just keeping up with him. Are you saying he single-handedly caught Ato? That's exactly what I'm saying. We weren't supposed to leave your side, but Billy knew we had to catch this guy. Look, we don't have a lot of time. Celine pulled at her hair. I just don't think I can go back on stage and continue the concert. I just can't. Not if someone is trying to kill me. How can I? No, I can't do it. The concert is over. It's, it's over. Celine, Phil snapped. You're a professional. Act like one. Get into your dressing room and get changed. Take a few minutes to recover. The show will go on. The show must go on. You've got Billy and Jack, and they're going to protect you. Where's the other one? He's, well, asleep. But if he wakes up, you'll have him there, too. And I'll keep my eyes open backstage for anything out of the ordinary. Celine whirled around in confusion. She turned to say something to Billy, but flushed, and turned and entered her dressing room. Phil put his hand on the door, then turned to Jack and Billy. There's fifteen minutes before she has to go back on stage. Why don't you two do some looking around? Ato isn't going anywhere. Actually, I'll bring him in here, where I can keep an eye on him. Ato wasn't that bright of a fellow, so I doubt he was acting alone. That's just not like him. Any idea what we'd be looking for? Billy asked. He'd helped find lost animals before and even helped track down the cow thief that had lured the animals away. But to find a killer in a crowd of people? That was something altogether different. Billy felt severely inadequate to perform the task. I wish I had anything that could help. I really do. Just walk around up there and keep your eyes open for anything out of the ordinary. Phil picked up Atho and disappeared into Celine's dressing room. Billy turned to head up the stairs, and his vision blurred momentarily, and then his vision tunneled. Something wasn't right. He stumbled as if his body had suddenly grown too heavy for his legs to support. Jack said something, but it sounded muddled and washed out. Billy fell to the ground and his head moved about of its own volition. He saw Jack shouting, but he couldn't make out anything. A laughter erupted inside of his head, a wicked, maniacal laughter that froze his blood. He should recognize that laugh. He should. He tried to place it, but the strain of trying to regain control of his body and remembered that voice proved to be too much, and his vision faded to black. Iman laughed long and hard, even after Billy's consciousness faded, and he pulled his head away from a large box carved of fine marble. He could control the beast of a man. Once he forced Billy back out of the way, his body was easy enough to control. When the time was right, he could take control and the big barbarian would be none the wiser. He would thought he would have to use fat to do the task, but now that Billy had come back to the stadium, he'd prove much more useful and disposable. He'd managed to watch Phil, Celine, Jack, and Billy talk about the pilot, Ato. What had Ato tried to do? Iman hadn't seen anything transpire. Something about an assassination attempt. When he entered Billy's head again, he'd have to go looking around for that memory and replay it. For now, he had a few moments to review what they were talking about, and without the bother of guests. They had all left during the intermission to seek out refreshments. Iman looked at the stage and its curtain. If Ato had succeeded in killing Selene, the plan would have failed. There was no way to speed things up. Everything had been planned and timelined down to the most precise minute. If Selene was killed before it was time, that would end everything. He narrowed his eyes to no more than tiny slits and concentrated on the stage. 
He couldn't let his plans be disrupted. He wanted to send Fat or Jack on a mission to find out who hired Ato to kill Celine, but he couldn't afford to separate Jack from Billy, and Fat had only managed to incapacitate himself. Still, everything had been averted for the time being, and though it relieved Iman to know that, it bothered him that someone could be trying to thwart his plans. But who? Who could know what he'd planned? He'd not let anyone know. He'd managed to keep everything very tight-lipped. He hadn't even told all the people working for him what the pieces were in play, and which weren't. Certainly he wouldn't tell Billy the buffoon. That barbarian could ruin everything if he had the slightest hint of the true magnitude of the evening. Phil's mind was a closed door to Iman. He'd tried to get inside of Phil's head once, and was physically forced out, almost as if Phil knew someone was trying to get in, and actively prevented it. Though he'd met Phil on more than one occasion, the monster of a man couldn't have known it had been Iman that tried to access his mind. Iman rubbed his temples. All his planning had been threatened. If it hadn't been for Billy's quick action, Celine would be dead and the timing all off. He had a special reward for Billy. Oh yes, a big surprise for the big fellow. Iman suppressed the need to snicker as two guests returned. <laughs> Billy struggled to his feet. His mind recoiled and he fumbled for Jack's shoulder and brought both of them to the floor. Fingers of pain squeezed his brain as if a snake had constricted around it. He fought against it as the laughter quieted and finally faded. As it faded, so did the pain. What the hell happened? Jack asked as he struggled to get out from under Billy. Billy rolled over onto his back and reclined for a moment on his backpack. His brain felt like something had been pulled out of it, like a large splinter pulled from under a fingernail. It felt good that it was out, but left a certain empty feeling that needed to be filled back in. Billy, are you okay? Billy looked up at Jack and blinked several times, as if it had helped him recover quicker. I... I don't know. I don't know what just happened. You're probably just tired or something. No, it's not that. I'm a little hungry, but I'm not tired. Something got into my brain. Something? Jack wrinkled his face. Well, not something, but someone. Like someone tried to take control and then just let go and I fell down. Jack opened his mouth nearly as wide as his eyes. In your head? Yeah. I, I just need a minute. My head hurt really bad, but it's not so bad now. Jack bit his lip and continued to look warily at Billy. Billy rubbed his face with his hands and shook his head to clear his mind. It didn't help. He dug into his ears with a finger and squeezed one eye closed and looked back at Jack. I... I think I'm okay. Billy got to his feet. Let's get up there and see what's going on. Are you sure? There's already been one attempt on Celine's life. If there's going to be another, I want to make sure we're ready for it. I'm just glad that she's safe down here with... Billy was cut off by a scream from inside Celine's dressing room. Celine's scream? Billy sprang to his feet and laid his shoulder into the door, smashing it inward. Inside the dressing room, Celine stood and screamed, holding her robe half on herself and exposing much of her body. Billy felt embarrassed for an instant for seeing her semi-naked body, but that embarrassment disappeared the instant he saw what she screamed about. Phil struggled with three beings. Each had an overly large head filled with sharp teeth and arms that ended in multiple tentacles, all tipped with narrow blades. Their greenish skin shimmered as if covered with slime, and they took turns slashing at Phil. If not for his scales, he'd have been cut to ribbons, Hey, Billy. Phil grunted as he struggled with one of the tentacles lashed around his neck. Can you give me a hand? The two not entwined around Phil looked at Billy and howled. Billy shrugged off his pack and quickly retrieved his axe. I thought you'd never ask. All thought of his personal pain faded as he tensed his body and prepared for the attacking monstrosities. Celine continued to scream her high-pitched wail that accented the howls of the monsters in a painful manner. Billy tried to block all sounds as he braced himself for impact. The first to reach him flailed its tentacles at him. Billy ducked under the tentacles and got under the monster's attack and flipped the beast over on onto the floor. It slid off Billy's back and left the disgusting wet slime on him. He didn't have time to think about it, as the second came in to slash and cut Billy. Billy reacted with his axe in a smile. He'd been waiting for a direct fight all day. A direct attack he could handle. Beast in a straight-on fight. Why did assassins need to be so sneaky? They were hard to find and defeat. This, on the other hand, Billy loved despite the screams it elicited from people. 
With a slash, Billy severed two tentacles from the maelstrom of writhing limbs and rolled to the floor. With a second slash, he cut the legs out from under the beast. Finally, he raised his axe to strike the beast down. He didn't get to deliver that blow, as the first that had rushed him launched at him and entwined him with his tentacles, his teeth gnashing and trying to bite him. Billy let go of the axe and pushed against the face, full of teeth, pressing down toward him. He felt the blade bite into his shoulder. The pain only increased his strength and he pushed back harder and harder, waiting to hear a snap. The head had bent fully backward. The beast had no bones to crack and break. He sank his fingers into its face and held it at bay with his left hand while he reached his belt and pulled his dagger. Another bladed tentacle pierced his calf. He grunted in pain as he sliced the monster's neck. Black goo issued forth and drenched Billy. The thing let out a final squawk and fell limp on top of Billy. He fought and struggled to free himself from the tangle of tentacles as the second, one leg shorter, crawled across the ground to Billy. He threw his dagger into it, but it managed to deflect it easily and continued its progress. With a blade in his shoulder and one in his leg, Billy only managed to do more damage to himself and didn't get any further away from the beast. Jack! Jack! Get it! Get it! Jack! I can't get free! Jack didn't move. He stood, frozen, and staring, mouth agape. Why didn't he move? Couldn't he see he was needed right now? Billy ripped and tore at the tentacles, entangling him. I'm trying, trying to get to you, Billy. Phil still struggled with his own monstrosity. Billy pulled the bladed tentacle from his shoulder. It stung from both the blade and the black ooze that covered Billy. He threw the tentacle at the oncoming monster, but it deflected it also. It raised two tentacles to strike at Billy. He rolled to the side and winced as the blade in his calf came free. The blades came down and sliced through the tentacles on Billy's leg and bit slightly into his thigh. With a growl, Billy tore himself free of the beast and reached for his battle axe. The pain gave him a clear focus of what he needed to do. He needed to stop this thing, and stop it now. With a grand swing, he sliced more tentacles off. He spun with the arc of the blade and back toward the beast and continued to spin as the blade sliced into the monster again and again, cutting it to pieces. He stopped spinning when it finally fell over. He couldn't raise the blade anymore. His shoulder burned with pain. He could feel the cut open further with each movement. His legs gave out and he fell to the floor. I've got this one. Billy looked up as Phil ripped the monster from his back. He'd closed his eyes as the blades kept stabbing in his face, but not finding anything to puncture. He pulled it apart as it screamed. She must die! She must die! You don't understand! She must die! It died in a gurgle of its own black blood. Billy struggled to his feet and walked over to the still screaming Celine. He ignored his own wounds as he looked her over to make sure she hadn't been hurt. As he did, he pulled her white robe about her and covered her up and closed the robe, getting blood and black ooze all over her and the robe as he did. He led her to the seat in front of the large mirror and sat her down. He turned to Phil. Where did her people go? And where did those monsters come from? Phil tossed the pieces of the monster to the floor and sneered in disgust. Those were her people. Thank you for taking the time to listen to The Continuing Adventures of Billy Barbarian. For more information on this book and its author, please visit ofgnomesanddwarves.com or jrmurdoch.com. And again, thank you for listening.